Thank you. Glad to see all of you. Before I start my remarks, I want to preclude that with just a one sentence uh, statement. I want to say that I thank my God that he has blessed me abundantly for 94 years and has given me enough strength to come and speak with you today. Uh, I think the information put out was that I was going to uh, speak about my um, memoirs. Well, I should have made this talk 20 years ago, and I think I could have done a much better job than I can do today, because in the last 20 years, I have lost a lot of my memory and have some trouble sometimes of pulling up the words that I want to use. Uh, with that said, I'll get right into, uh, of course, I'm Odell Walker, and all of you know that. I do not have a middle name. I asked my mother one time, uh, why she named me Odell. And she said, well, I just thought it sounded a little better than Tom, Dick, and Harry. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps I'm in good company because sometime during the 1800s, there was a mayor of New York City uh, by the name of Odell. <laughs> I was born to April 30, 1929, on the family farm located on the Katoa Dikersburg Road. My parents were Percy Lee Walker and Lena Bell Castleberry Walker. I, I was born in the same year that our nation went into that deep sea coal of uh, the Great Depression. It was filled, it was a crisis, and it was filled with suffering, disaster, and hunger. Now then, uh, I can remember a few of the later years and how some things happened. I remember the people living on the farm had an advantage of their city cousins, because at that time, uh, farmers raised more than 50% of what they uh, ate. Uh, our problem, I can remember, I don't think we ever uh, missed a meal, but we had some well, sometimes that were pretty skimpy. For instance, when you sat down for supper, you might have a bowl of beans and a piece of cornbread and a glass of milk, but at least you didn't go to bed hungry, and there were a lot of people who did go to bed hungry. Uh, so and one of the things that affected my family and most families the most uh, was clothing. If you had any clothes to wear, you had to purchase that at the store. And if you and my parents didn't have had very, if any money, very little. But if they went to buy clothes, they had to have cash, which they didn't have. And I remember that my brothers and I uh, wore hand-me-down clothes until they were ragged and threadbare. Now then, I had five brothers, Davis, Doyle, William Olive, Roy and Ray, and Roy and Ray were twins. Now then, on the farm, when children got up the age where they could work, they were put to work at a pretty young age. Maybe they could do just little simple jobs like carrying in stove wood or 
feeding the chickens or, or sweeping the porch. And as we grew older, we took on uh, uh, more uh, difficult jobs. I did about everything on the farm uh, that people did uh, during that time. Uh, I remember planting corn with a one-row corn planter pulled by a horse. And I remember a little later uh, that I um, worked with my mother in the garden a whole lot. And then as I got a little older, I began to work a little bit in the fields. I'd go out in the fields and chop out corn or other similar work. And then when I came home, I uh, was tired. I'd sit down on the porch until uh, supper was ready, and I would eat my supper, wash my feet, and go to bed, and wake up the next morning and start the same routine again. I was a barefooted boy coming in and out of the field. I would hang the hole on the guard gate and go in to eat. Now then, let me say a word or two about my education. Uh, when I was old enough to go to school, I went to the Hebron one-room school. Now from our house to the schoolhouse, it was about two miles. But the way the crow flies, it was about a mile. So my brothers and me, we walked through the fields and through the woods and across the ditches, climbed barbed wire fences, and we got to school. Well, I pretty much enjoyed my school years at Hebron. Uh, we had, uh, along with our learning, we had fun. Uh, we played on the playground during recess in the noon hour. And as I reflect back over the teachers we had, I would rate them generally as fair to good. I think I only had one washout in the group. Now then, when I finished the eighth grade in the fall of 1944, I entered high school at the old Katoa High School. Now then, for the first two years in high school, I rode a horse because the school system didn't provide uh, any transportation. However, in 19, uh, 1946 and 47, there were three school districts in the county, uh, Katoa, Eddyville, and the county at large. At those dates, they all consolidated into one, and it became the Lyon County High School. Now, I was in the last class that uh, was in the old Qatar school, and that year uh, I was a, a junior. Then uh, the senior year, it had come in as the Lyon County High School, and I was uh, in that class. The class uh, graduated 44 students, only three of us still living. Uh, and I, I was in the first class of that school, and I participated in a lot of the school activities. And at one time, I was president of the FFA, and I graduated in that first class. 1948, fall of the year, uh, I enrolled in... David Lipscomb College, now uh, Lipscomb University, and I worked part-time for the college uh, to help pay my college expenses. On March the 30th, 1951, I probably made the greatest decision of my entire life. 
At that time, I married my high school sweetheart, Wanda, Wanda Lee Riley. Her parents were Simon Riley and Eliza White Riley. Her life influenced me greatly. There were three people in my life that, entered, that uh, influenced me the most. It was my mother and my father and my wife. Oh, my wife was beyond really a description. She influenced me for the better uh, during her life. She had many talents. She was a counselor uh, and a consultant, and she stood by me in full support in anything that, uh, that I attempted. Uh, give you one little example. I had written a story, and I had used the word kids. She looked it over. And she said, would it be better acceptable if he used the word children? Well, of course, she was right. Now, she used that same principle in small things and the biggest things of life. Um, she was a great mother. We had two healthy children, and they are both present here to, uh, today. We have four grandchildren and seven great-grandchildren. I have lived a happy and blissful life with my wife, Wanda, because she stood with me through everything thick and thin. She was taken away about five years ago by Alzheimer's disease, and I now live by myself. <clears throat> now then, this little footnote uh, to the ladies. She liked nice clothes <laughs> and jewelry, and she dressed like a queen. So when I went anywhere, I didn't have to be ashamed of my wife. <laughs> Now, after graduation from college, uh, we moved back to Lyon County to a farm that we owned. Now, let me tell you a little bit about my career. Now, let me state here that through my life, I have made a lot of mistakes and bad judgments, but along the way, I have tried to correct those. In the fall of 1953, I started teaching school at the uh, junior high school at Old Eddyville uh, and driving a school bus. Uh, I taught at Old Eddyville for three years. And then in the fall of 1956, I became uh, the principal of the Free Donor School System. I was active in community affairs, and along the way somewhere, I was uh, selected or elected mayor of the city of Fredonia. Well, now the city council and I are doing all right, keeping the, keeping the city running. Uh, we kept the lights on at night in the streets, filled up the potholes in, in the um, uh, streets. Now then, one night, after a meeting of the Lions Club, and I was a charter member of the Lions Club, only two of us still living, myself and Jimmy Riley. After the meeting was over, Virgil Coleman was... Uh, president of the bank, and he called me over to one side and said, Old Dale, won't speak with you a minute. His message was a bit shocking. He said, No, Dale, 
the worst thing that this city needs is a sufficient water system. We have tried two times and failed. I would like for you to look into it and check out and see if there is any possibility uh, that uh, we could obtain a, a municipal water system. And I thought to myself, well, uh, you're asking for a great big job. <laughs> you're asking for a boy to do a man's job. Uh, but just to please him at the time, I made a few contacts at a contact uh, engineering firm in Nashville by the name of Yearwood and Johnson. And I, I had some knowledge of the Yearwood family, and I talked to him and told him what our situation was. And he said, well, I'll send an engineer down to your place and uh, let him make a preliminary survey. He came down one day, uh, he drove the streets, he looked at the town plot, he looked at everything, and uh, finished up and filled out his report. And I asked him, what is the cost estimate? And he said, well, in the neighborhood of a half million dollars. <laughs> well, that shocked me. And I thought that was the end of that. And uh, the biggest piece of money I ever saw, I, pray, I guess, was a hundred dollar bill. And half a million dollars at that time to me looked bigger than a moon. Now then, at this point, there was truly Lady Luck must have been on my side. I thought I'd just go tell him that going to cost half a million dollars and the city no way could raise for a half million dollars but overnight I thought well I'll just make a quick look into the financing of it and I spent several days checking with the finance uh, 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 people and uh, I wanted to know if there were any grants or any state or federal money that would funnel uh, some money into the construction of a water system. And I finally came to the National Savings and Loan Association in Atlanta, Georgia, and they agreed to finance the project on a long-term loan of 40 years. Well, <laughs> we was making some progress, I guess. <clears throat> now then, we got to thinking more about the water system, and the question came up with us, where are you going to get the water? Mill Bluff and Livingston Creek couldn't be depended on to supply adequate uh, supply of water a uh, year long every year. And uh, it was a good many miles to Dykesburg to the Cumberland River and about that far to Lake Barkley. Now then, let me talk a bit about the relationship with Eddyville. We, you know that... Uh, during the transition and relocation and, de and frustration of everybody in Lyon County, the government had built for Eddyville a fairly large, up-to-date uh, water uh, filtration plant down by the old Katoa Springs, and they were taking their water from the lake. And... Uh, if I remember correctly, and I could be corrected, I think the plant had the capacity to produce two to three times the amount of water that uh, Eddyville was using. So we got 
we got word on that, and we went over over to Eddieville and talked with the the council and those in charge, and said, "Would you share your water with us?" Uh, they said, "Well, it said take a long time to uh, get this water from Eddieville to Freed only in a bucket." <laughs> So when we well, were getting ready to take bids, uh, in the in the in the preparation of all of the uh, things included, it was agreed to lay a pipeline from Fredonia to Eddieville. Eddieville agreed to send water out about the outer city, city limits, out to Fredonia Road and uh, across the railroad, and there's still a little house there that was used as a measuring station. station and the water was measured from Eddieville and went into Fredonia's water line, and uh, uh, Fredonia was able to provide water for all of those people who were living along the road and on into Eddieville. So Eddieville is to be thanked. And all of these years, I think this arrangement has gone off very smoothly. I haven't, I didn't have any difficulties while I was town mayor, and I haven't heard of any difficulties as I think everything has worked well. We were now ready to take bids. Eddieville, uh, the bids were taken, the job was completed. There was no major problems, maybe a little change order now and then, but everything went smooth. That was my first, I guess you would say, uh, widespread recognition of myself because uh, that was looked upon as being quite an accomplishment. Uh, changed my name from Odell to Mr. Walker. <laughs> <laughs> People, you'd meet them on the street and they'd slap you on the shoulder, say, oh, said, thank you for getting water for us. So I, I was least appreciated. Now then, after I finished that, I went back to my old routine and Wanda and I were very satisfied with our situation. Uh, she was working as a secretary. Uh, she worked at three different places over the years. First in the Caldwell County School System, and a short time at the newspaper here in Eddyville, and then she hired on with Hopkinsville Community College and stayed in that job until she retired. Uh, I was making... Uh, a good salary at that time. We had a nice house, good neighbors, and we we thought everything was fine for us. Uh, we enjoyed what what we were doing, what we had, and a good lifestyle with a little extra money to get a few of the things that we wanted. And uh, now then, about uh, somewhat like a year later, the big surprise. I was sitting in my office one morning, and about mid-morning, the chairman of the Board of Education come in and sat down in my office, and we talked a while, and uh, without any comments or asking any questions, uh, he just simply said, Odell, uh, Bob Forsythe's not going to be superintendent next year. Would you like to have that position? <laughs> well, that's just like coming in and telling you you got a job. And I was shocked. And I said, well, on the spot, I didn't know whether to say yes or no. But I said, well, I'll have to talk with my wife about it and talk it over. And uh, I'll let you know tomorrow. And we spent a good bit of time talking about it and the changes it bring about in our life. 
earlier was talking about Wanda, and I remember one statement that she made uh, while we were discussing this. She said, if the school board uh, believes that you can do the job, I believe you can do the job. So that's when a, a good wife standing by your side comes to your rescue. Well, the request, the request was accepted, and I took the job. The, the school system was running fairly smooth, the, the entire county system, but there were a few uh, little problems that needed to be addressed. Uh, it was that there, the high school was overcrowded at the Butler Building. Uh, we were putting students in every room possible and brought in some uh, temporary uh, portable classrooms. And as time passed, uh, the discussion of building a new high school came up. And we, the board, and I talked about it for a good long time. And then uh, uh, it was suggested that it be put on the ballot and raise a tax uh, for the purpose of constructing a schoolhouse, a school building. Now then, uh, that, that put me in another uh, busy situation. Land was purchased about 40 acres on the Fredonia Road, uh, just outside this, or maybe within the border of the city limits of Eddyville. And as I recall, the students uh, entered the high school in the fall of 1972. So I didn't go into all the details of the construction of it and all. And we got that put behind us, and the mess, mess, next thing that came up was a talk about obtaining a vocational school. Now then, in my mind at that time, and the mind of most people around, it was impossible. Most of your vacation, uh, vocational schools were located in the larger cities like Paducah or Hopkinsville or Somerset or something like that. But uh, the board was insistent that we give it a try, and if we got an answer no, we just have to deal with it. Uh, I worked pretty hard and long on that. I gathered up all of the printed material on vocational schools that I could find and read them, to learn their vocabulary. You know, every job has their, their own system of words and techniques and sayings. And uh, I wanted to know uh, what their lingo was. And uh, that would help me in writing out the plan. I read material, I talked to some vocational uh, employees and got information from them and put it together and sent it to Frankfurt. And it was under review by the State Department of Education. But I remember that one of the many things uh, required that we had to take a 12 member uh, a group of people uh, to Frankfurt to meet with the vocational school uh, department and be asked questions and ask and answer questions and all of that. So I knew that that would uh, that would weigh heavy in the state's decision. Now I was very careful to select the people. I tried to select somebody uh, that represented all the jobs and uh, people, what people were working at. Uh, 
uh, Harvin Industries was there. I got their superintendent. I got Rumsey Taylor, who ran the Princeton Lumber Company, and uh, John Morgan from the courthouse, and John Williams uh, from the bank, and others that uh, I don't remember right off. But we made the trip to Princeton, I mean to, to uh, Frankfurt. Now, another thing that I looked for in these people was how can they talk? Can they talk straightforward, a direct answer to the question, and not hum and haw and say, well, I, I don't know, I believe, or if, and, and so forth. I, pe I picked people that I knew could speak well and would make a, a influence on the ones we were talking to. Now then, to my surprise, and to surprise about everybody around, the state uh, granted it. So there I went again into a building process of building a vocational school on the campus of the high school. We got the building completed, and I'll not go into any of that, and classes began. Now, I consider this one of the, the top achievements in, my, in all of my career for this reason. When school uh, students were in high school along about the junior year, uh, they began thinking about their future. What am I going to do when I get out of high school? Different ones were making different decisions. Some planned to go into the academic uh, professions, which would necessitate going to college, but there were some that didn't want to go to college and were very skilled at their hands, and they had rather wa uh, work with their head and a hammer than to work with their head and a pencil. So everything went well. This was not a major problem, but it was one that required a good bit of consideration, and that was the matter of desegregation. To bring the black children from the Dodson School and place them in the proper class or grade in the regular white schools. We had a few little bubbles of uh, in dealing with that, but nothing, uh, nothing very serious. In fact, we didn't have to call the police or anything like that. We kept it under control and it all worked out all right. At that time, uh, there wasn't any more uh, projects or building uh, missions or anything of that nature. So I settled in to just routine, everyday activities of school. Now, after 30 years in public education, I retired. Well, that's about halfway through it. After retirement, Wanda and I traveled considerably. We saw all of the, not all, but a lot of the place of uh, interest in, in the country, and we saw a lot of them from Niagara Falls uh, in uh, New York to Rosemetry in California. Now then, after my retirement, I did a lot of volunteer work. I joined the Historical Society and was am a life member. And I worked with some of those early dedicated uh, people uh, uh, like Barbara Story and Mr. Beatty and Ms. Grant and many others who had a desire to save at least some of our uh, historical heritage. Now, we lost a lot of that in the relocation and everything. 
and a lot of things were thrown away that would have been valuable. Now then, my undergraduate major in college uh, was history, and I liked the history, and uh, it came in pretty handy later on. I had good teachers, and they went a little bit past teaching history and taught us how to do research. If you want to know something, where do you go to find it? They taught us those principles. <coughs> One day I was in the library and I was doing some research for myself and I can't remember to save my life what it was. But somewhere between the I had researched it and I had written it out on a piece of paper and somewhere in the round I met up with Bobby Faust. <laughs> she said, Odell, what are you doing? I said, well, I've been down to the library doing some research on this or whatever it was. And she said, let me look at it. Well, she read it and she said, well, I like this. Would you consider writing a, a newspaper article each week about our local history? Well, I wasn't smart enough then to say no. <laughs> <laughs> so I spent four or five years writing newspaper articles. And later on, uh, I wrote for this Kentucky magazine called The Kentucky Explorer. It was published in Jackson, Kentucky, and I wrote for several years and contributed uh, stories to this magazine. Now, it closed about four or five years ago, and the last issue, uh, they honored me, which I appreciated. And uh, the story that I used for that last issue was James Green, he owned a hundred and operated over a hundred steamboats and a great contributor to the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville. And so I give him the title, the Steamboat King of the Cumberland. Now I continue to write about uh, 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 historical events uh, for uh, the newspaper, this magazine, and occasionally my, uh, stories to different magazines. The articles were generally well-liked, and I got a good response from the uh, people that uh, they read them, and I would run into them from time to time, and they would say, I enjoy the articles that you write on our histor uh, past history, and uh, that gave me a wider range of recognition. And 1992, I was selected Citizen of the Year. And during the Founders' Day at Eddyville, now that was an honor. 1994, I published my first book, which was Profiles of the Past, which contained primarily a combination putting together uh, the uh, articles that I had written for the newspaper. About that time, uh, someone placed my name on the Internet, the name and title, and I began to receive requests for information from people all over the nation that had a special interest back in Lyon County, had roots back here, want to know something about their family, you name it, and they want to know it. And I'm, I'm estimating that over uh, that time, until this time, I have answered at least 200 letters. Uh, I did not charge a fee for this, but the majority uh, included a, a nice honorarium for me. I have lost count of the speeches I've made. 
but perhaps the one of uh, greatest uh, recognition was that I had an invitation to speak to the Fairhaven, Vermont Historical Society. Now then, at that time, my health began to go into slow decline, and I slowed down pretty much. And from that time on till now, <laughs> I've slowed down from not much to nearly nothing. <laughs> I, I had a small uh, woodworking shop in my basement, and I did some woodwork, made some trinkets and things. One of the jobs was to repair and refinish old furniture. Now then, let me see if there's a few things that, that I didn't include and need to catch up with. I have been a member of three service clubs, Rotary, Lions, and Kiwanis. And at one time, I was president of two of them. I had four, four major surgeries in the last part of my life. Oh, I don't, don't want to overlook this one. I like to hunt and fish, <laughs> if I had a little free time. One of them that I enjoyed was jug fishing at night on the lower Cumberland River. Uh, now, now then, over the over the years, I have received a stack of plaques, honors, awards, complimentary letters, and once in a while I look through them and uh, I look back over my life and uh, it brings back great memories to me. Now then, if we were going to sing a closing song, I suppose it would be uh, old Lang Syne. <laughs> it's been a pleasure to be with you, and I say, fare thee well, fare thee well. God imbues each and every one of us with gifts and talents that he wants us to use when when we're called out. <laughs> and and you're going to get a big hug one of these days and you have done well. Thank you. <laughs> you are a, truly a, a an encyclopedia, a wonderful wonderful person. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.